Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Coming up on Market to Market, new initiatives from the Secretary on a Midwest road trip. A lawsuit against the beef checkoff is turned around at the courthouse door. Bringing the message from Kansas cattle feedlots to the halls of Congress. Even considering the cost, the extra fuel costs. And market analysis with Elaine Cobb, next. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, July 1 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. No amount of fireworks will distract from the concerns over higher interest rates and a potential recession, not even lower fuel prices. As we celebrate the nation's birthday, drivers are seeing some relief in the form of lower fuel prices. AAA reports the price of a gallon of gasoline has dropped to 484. That's a penny less from last week. The Personal Consumption Expenditures Index, the measure of inflation followed closely by the Fed, rose six-tenths of a percent last month. The year-over-year -year rate climbed to 6.3 percent. Without the swings brought on by food and energy prices, core PCE held steady. The Secretary of Agriculture beat the holiday rush to get out of the city for two different events aimed at rural America. John Torpy was on the trip and begins with a look at a new program to squeeze just a little more out of farm commodities. USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack hit the road this week, announcing new policy initiatives in the Hawkeye State. This is about creating new economic opportunity for farmers and for rural areas. Vilsack's first stop was at a family-owned dairy and creamery in Ely, Iowa where he announced a $10 million pilot program designed to encourage the creation of bio-based products in rural America. The intent of the package is to turn crop residue and other agricultural waste into construction materials and consumer products. All of this is designed to support the Climate Smart uh, Agricultural Commodity Initiative uh, that this administration is focused on. And all of that is designed to create two things, more farm income and more jobs in rural places. The directive in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law pairs the USDA with land-grant universities to study the pros and cons of manufacturing with materials derived from crop residue and farm waste. The following day, Secretary Vilsack stopped at a farm just west of Minburn. There he told a crowd that more than $4 billion has been distributed out of the USDA's emergency relief program. The payments were made to agricultural and livestock producers who were impacted by severe weather events in 2020 and 2021. I think we're now realizing that we're going to see uh, disasters of, uh, of, of unprecedented number or unprecedented strength or unprecedented cost. And so we need to have the flexibility to be able to, to shift and adjust our disaster programs to meet the regional or local need. The Disaster Relief Fund was created in 2021 when President Joe Biden signed it into law. A total of $10 billion is available for producers impacted by wildfires, droughts, hurricanes, winter storms, and other natural disasters eligible for aid. The relief package also covers livestock producers who incurred losses due to drought and wildfire in 2021. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. One of the Supreme Court's final decisions of the term cuts the ability of the EPA to regulate power plants emissions. The ruling may be an indicator that the court is poised to block President Biden's work to mitigate climate change. Among the other rulings was a challenge to stop government checkoff programs. Peter Tubbs has our report. This week. 
The United States Supreme Court rejected a challenge from Ranchers Cattlemen Action Legal Fund United Stock Growers of America, or RCAF, over the implementation of the Beef Checkoff Program. In 2016, RCAF alleged the Beef Checkoff required cattle producers to subsidize the private speech of private entities, namely marketing arms of state beef boards. RCAF won an initial injunction in 2017, after which the USDA entered a Memorandum of Understanding with the Beef Councils of 20 states to centralize the marketing messages for the beef checkoff. The Ninth Circuit Court ruled in 2021 that their reorganization by the USDA satisfied RCAF's request that beef checkoff dollars not fund private speech. The Supreme Court concurred by not hearing the challenge. The National Cattlemen's Beef Association noted the end of the lawsuit. The Supreme Court's rejection of RCAF's petition confirms the beef checkoff and its overseers are adhering to the letter and spirit of the laws that protect and guide producer investments in the program. RCAF is pledging to seek further changes to the operation of the beef checkoff. We continue to work in Congress on legislation that would achieve the reforms we seek in the, legis in the checkoff program including making the checkoff a purely voluntary program as opposed to a mandatory program, which uh, makes it a, just a huge subsidy program in the cattle industry. And it's a subsidy program that we believe benefits the multinational corporations at the expense of America's independent cattle producers. From Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Last week, a bill to increase price transparency between packers and cattle producers made its way out of the Senate Agriculture Committee. Many outside the Beltway with mud on their boots are concerned about the unintended effect this measure might have on the cattle industry. As part of the MTOM podcast, I spoke with one of those cattlemen who built his independent feedlot with his brother and sees the legislation as a major threat to his way of life. A short segment of that conversation is this week's cover story. About the nature of our business because our business is something that in Congress they were saying no longer exists. But uh, you know, we we determined a long time ago when we were in our early 30s that somebody was going to tell our story as cattlemen, but specifically uh, feed yard operators and. I guess we were just bold enough to say, well, well, we'll tell it ourselves and make sure it's right. And so we've been willing to be in the public eye for a long time. But then last fall, I was asked to serve as president elect of the Kansas Livestock Association. You know, I don't think it was accidental that I was asked to go to DC. I think the nature of my business being an independent custom finishing feedlot uh, was, was part of that story. But then it wasn't foreign for me to sit in front of a bunch of people and get asked hard questions. We do that all the time. I've had people from the World Wildlife Fund at our operation, farmers and ranchers and veterinarians and chefs from all over the world that sometimes don't have an understanding of what a CAFO is. And so I don't mind being in a situation where uh, I'm going to get asked the tough questions and have to defend them. I want to go all the way back to the very first thing you said. You were told in the hearing that your type of business doesn't exist anymore. Is that the independent feeding operation? Is that what you meant with that? Yeah. So, uh, you know, both for sure, uh, Senator Grassley alluded to the fact that there's no independent feedlots anymore. Uh, Mr. Ruffin, who is a rancher and an attorney in Missouri, who testified along with me. And then uh, Miss. Shelly Zeesh out of North Dakota, who testified along with me, basically said there's no such thing as independent feedlots anymore. It's all corporate, which I'm not going to deny. There's a lot of corporate feed yards out there that own all their cattle, but they have to get those cattle somewhere. Uh, and that's farmers and ranchers from across the U.S. But, but my business, uh, we are exclusively custom. So my brother and I started with nothing. We literally bought a feedlot with a handshake as our down payment and collateral. And one of our loan covenants was you're not going to own cattle. We had way too much risk and uh, were highly leveraged to begin with. And, and our bankers said, no, cattle ownership is not going to be a part of our deal. Is there going to be a perfect bill or should we just let this thing be? Well, I don't believe there's going to be a perfect bill. And frankly, uh, I don't I don't believe that government regulation is 
is better in many cases. I believe the private sector can sort things out. Uh, I am, there's a lot of things that myself, Kansas Livestock Association, NCBA, National Cattlemen's Beef Association are not opposed to, you know, widening the reporting regions for LMR. That's a good thing to get more data. Uh, you know, the cattle contract library, as long as it's done with confidentiality, uh, you know, that could be a good thing. Uh, the special investigator bill, that I would argue the authority to, to make sure that the packers and stockyards is followed already exists and duplicating or creating another agency for one adds to levels of bureau bureaucracy it does confuse who has jurisdiction and frankly if you ask me it's an admission on behalf of congress that they haven't been enforcing the laws that were already in place to begin with the biggest thing that i'm opposed to and and frankly ncba and kla is the mandate just because who gets to choose is the packer, which gives them more leverage. And, and I've got friends that do manage large corporate yards. And uh, matter of fact, the CEO of one large yard, actually a collection of yards, told me months ago, uh, he said, listen, if I'm sitting in the sale barn buying cattle to fill our yards, which those larger yards are doing every single day of the year, he said, if I don't know how I get to market those calves the day I buy them, my risk just went up, which means my price just went down. What I can what I can stick my neck out for, because even the corporate yards, they're not making very big margins. The way a feed yard works is to capture very, very thin margins across a large population of cattle. But if all of a sudden there's some hiccup like, you can't market them the way you thought you were going to, and that thin margin goes away. Well, guess what? Your profitability just just evaporated. So you think things are cyclical? Because, I mean, we look at packer margin and go, boy, that looks pretty good right now. Is that going to stay this way forever? Do you think that's what Congress is trying to tackle? Well, I know things are cyclical, which is why we have this conversation about once every 10 years. And that's because, you know, there's an old saying that, the American farmer can ruin a bull market in one year. You know, wheat gets high, guess what? Everybody's gonna raise wheat next year and the price goes down. That kind of goes hand in hand with the old saying, the cure for high prices is high prices. And cattlemen are no different. It just takes us longer. The full conversation with Sean Tiffany is available now on the Market to Market YouTube channel. New episodes of the MTOM podcast come out each Tuesday. Next, the Market to Market Report. Quarterly grain stocks numbers and an acreage report joined weather as topics of conversations at the kitchen table. The market quickly digested the news and grains made a run lower for the week. The nearby wheat contract plummeted again, this time off 91 cents or 10 percent, while September corn dropped 46 cents. Soybeans briefly rode the wave of fewer acres planted before turning sharply lower. The nearby soybean contract improved eight cents. August meal added 1070 per ton. December cotton fell 57 cents per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, August class three milk futures lost $1.17. Lower grain boosted some of the livestock. August cattle added $1.22. August feeders put on $2.00 and the August lean hog contract declined. 380. In the currency markets, U.S. dollar index improved by 96 ticks. August crude oil gained 91 cents per barrel. Comex gold lost 22.70 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index fell 15 points to finish at 718.70. Joining us now to break down these markets, our friend Elaine Cub. Hello, hello, hello. Happy birthday, Paul. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Also to Naomi Bloom. Absolutely. Yes. Happy birthday, Naomi. Hell, but not yours. Not this month. Not today. Anybody celebrating who has wheat right now? Well, 
I mean, what's wrong with you know? It's it's still what's wrong nine, with a nine dollar and a half? Yeah. But, you know, if you're harvesting wheat in Kansas, let's say this past week. Uh, the w yields have been extremely variable, which means some of them have been good, protein generally above 12%. So I think the general attitude from the harvest has been pretty positive. People are pretty happy with it. And if you're just going to take it to the elevator and sell it for $9 cash, I mean, I know it's not as good as it once was a few months ago, but in historical terms, you know, it's still $9 wheat. So when you put it into the perspective, and, and that's what I heard somebody describe, the stock market. Yes, it's been a, we're six months into the year. It's been a terrible year when you look at it in that standpoint. But if you go back five years, it's pretty good. So closing September wheat, 846. What are you doing come Tuesday? When right. the markets reopen. This is the problem. I knew some I knew you were gonna ask me this. And I, I honestly don't know what to say about wheat because there's not there's not like a clear seasonal expectation in wheat. There never is, which is one of the reasons why I think a lot of producers do tend to just sell off the combine at harvest because you know there there isn't necessarily always a harvest low. It's usually an okay time to do it. And it's just so volatile and it's so based on what's going on in the rest of the world. It's actually the European wheat futures were the ones that sort of triggered this slide. And the Kansas City futures have since outpaced them in this downward movement. But um, because you don't really have any sort of expectation that it's necessarily going to recover, but it might recover if something else strange happens in Ukraine or Russia, you know, it's, it's a really tricky answer. And, you know, like I said, it's $9 wheat. It's not wrong to sell $9 wheat. Well, in the Russia story, I mean, there's this... Oh, all of a sudden, Russia has all this wheat on the market. Ah, yes. And the spirit, the thought is they're stealing it from Ukraine. Absolutely. So what is that doing for maybe the global price and the global outlook? Absolutely. I think that's absolutely the reason why that European wheat futures did trigger this slide, did start sliding. The Financial Times had a really good investigation where they had satellite imagery of grain ships being loaded out of Crimea, which doesn't grow a lot of wheat. So it's, it's wheat that has been stolen or coerced um, from Ukrainian farmers, and then the bill of lading says Russia. So that's absolutely what's happening. And I think it's completely bananas, right, to think that that would send the price of wheat down to know that stolen grain is coming on the market. But from a supply and demand perspective, it is relieving that Middle Eastern wheat market. It's getting into Turkey and Syria, and so that's absolutely what's happening. The market might not necessarily care where it comes from as long as it gets to... The supply is there. Okay. Yeah. All right, in corn... Uh, we're dealing with this whole knee-high by the 4th of July. We're past it. We've always been past that. But there's some corn. No, not this year. That's the thing. Yeah. This year it actually is yeah. lower. It's behind schedule. What's that doing to this market? Well, yeah, it's a funny time for, for corn condition ratings. Yeah, and where I'm from in the eastern Dakotas, it is short, but I have short knees. It absolutely is knee-high by the 4th of July. But always is, right? <laughs> yeah, so this is fine. Um, but it is interesting. I think it'll probably catch up. The more interesting thing is the flash drought scenario sort of in southern Minnesota, portions of Iowa. There's a streak of it from like Missouri into Indiana. So there's places where they really do need this rain and we're getting the rain. In fact, I was driving through on the, on the drought monitor. There's a little red spot south of Sioux City. And as I was driving through there today, it was raining. So you got to think we've got three days. Of I'm being told <laughs> Sioux City wants you to drive back through there on your way home. <laughs> Absolutely. So we have three days of weather before the market's going to open back up again on Tuesday. So, you know, it really depends how much rain happens and where it happens and who chooses to respond to that. Do farmers choose to respond to that rain by selling more or do speculative traders choose to respond to a lack of rain by, you know, putting in more risk premium? I really couldn't predict what's going to happen on Tuesday, but I suspect there will be a large movement one way or another based on this weather. But that was also a, a school of thought going to the whole people are selling. Maybe it's the speculators. Maybe it's not. Ahead of that, such a long, vital, volatile window. Yeah. And that's maybe most of this. Or do you think this is, when are we oh, going to yeah. sort that out? Yeah, this is the time of year. Absolutely. This is not a coincidence that we're having a big market movement at this time of year. I looked back, you remember 2012, 10 years ago, this is when we had that big vertical run up because this is when the market looks around, can really make a confident prediction about yields because it is knee high. I mean, it's at a, a growth stage where you can be pretty confident about how yields might eventually turn out in a normal year. So this is absolutely, it happened in 2008, 2011. This is very much the time of year when the market sort of gets an overall feeling for what the crop is going to do and trades correspondingly. The market's saying prove it. And finally, yeah. maybe the weather is proving yeah. that it's yeah. that way. All right, soybeans, because that's also the same story, yeah. similar in beans. However, <laughs> less acreage, yeah. 
there was thought that we were going to have less acres, yep. but not this much. But there's a caveat. It's like the USDA got an extension on its term paper. Yeah. Right? Very much so. They're the, they put out a number, which is an ostensibly bullish number, saying we only have 88 million acres of soybeans planted instead of 90 million acres. So if nothing else changes and you took those millions of acres off, you, there goes your 280 million bushels of ending stocks. Ending stocks would effectively go to zero. I mean, that's not what's going to happen. But you're absolutely right is that these 88 million acres that they put out in the June acreage report is an asterisk, right? Because at the time when that survey was done in mid-June, there were still soybeans being planted in North Dakota. And they have acknowledged that. And they sort of tried to build that into that number, but they do very much expect to put out a revised number in August. So, you know, eventually the supply and demand tables will reflect reality. But for now, the markets, I don't know, just either ignored the number or were reacting to other things, including the weather. Okay, so behind the scenes here, this is the market analysis segment. We're going to do a Market Plus. It's separate. It's a podcast. It's on video. We have a bunch of questions that will dive in more to what Elaine is saying. But we also ask for social media questions. And right now, let's go to the one. Let's go with Russ and Postville. Basis question gets our attention for Elaine. If so much grain is still on the farm, why are basis levels so high? Yeah, that was another really interesting part from the reports this week is the on-farm stocks of corn specifically uh, was 22%, which is higher than usual, higher than last year, higher than, than most years, which is very clever, right? I mean, I think farmers knew going into this year that we, you know, relatively short supply or short stocks to use ratio. And so they had a feeling that there would be a summer run up and a tight supply for a tight market for corn this summer and holding on to some of it. Great move. But he, um, he's absolutely right to point out that basis is variable. Again, I'll use the word variable because it really depends on where you are. In Iowa, you know, actually Eddyville is like 35 over. So you've got $8 corn opportunities to sell in Iowa, but it is all really dependent upon transportation costs. That's that's the the textbook thing about basis, right? It's a uh, reflection of local supply and demand and transportation costs. So if you're in the Dakotas where you've got to put a lot of rail freight on that, you could have a dollar under basis. If you're down in the panhandle of Texas where you're screaming for grain and there's a drought, basis could be a dollar over. So there's just a very, very wide range of cash prices for corn specifically right now. It could be 640 to 840. Could, depends on where you are. I don't know if it's, I think it's you that said this, but really all basis is local. Yes. It's like the old saying, all, po all politics is local, but, and, and that matters. And so everybody's story is different. And w when fuel prices are like this, it makes, it makes everybody's uh, situation so wildly different. It will drive down the prices for f at the farm gate for people who have to put a lot of freight to get it to a market and drive up the prices for the end users. So it's nothing good happens when you have diesel at $6 or whatever. Let's go back to Texas, cattle country. Uh, this is a story that continues to see higher numbers of cattle getting processed. Is that's what? Is that's what? Why is that not reflecting in a up market this week? Well, you know, the, actually, the cash market was was steady to a dollar lower, like a dollar thirty eight. So the cash market held up better than the futures market did. Um, you're absolutely right to point out that there's kind of a bearish feel for the live cattle and for the beef sort of wholesale prices themselves going into July, going into um, midsummer. There's sort of a sense that they will be a little bit oversupplied because the packers were so had such a strong appetite in June. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's some headwinds there for the live cattle market, but feeder cattle. My goodness. What's going on in feeder cattle? My goodness. So there were some hot, hot sales this past week. Bassett, Nebraska had six weight calves at like 229, and that wasn't just a fluke. There were multiple lots that sold there. Mitchell, South Dakota, 210, I want to say. So even though, like, overall, and this isn't a, a really strong time of year to see lots of numbers, but when you've got a room full of bidders that really wanted to put these animals on feed, despite the prices of feed, they can really get in there and bid up those calves. So I, that was exciting. That was a really exciting thing to see for feeder cattle. So what does that say long term? Because there have been people sitting in this chair for the last two months that saw the summer as an improved time. Then that timetable got moved up. Did the timetable move up or is this the beginning of a this, longer I, March higher? Yeah, I think this is this is the way it's going to be. I mean, the, the supply of feeder cattle that are not already on feed because we do have more of them on feed than usual because of the drought and such. So the supply that are out there to be bought yet that aren't already on feed is down something like 3%. This will continue to be the case for the foreseeable future because our breeding herd is, of course, diminished by this drought. In the hog market, though, down yeah. this week. 
is that uh, you know pigs the pigs and hog report yeah. was not viewed the most positive no the problem with the, the yeah the hogs and pigs everything the breeding herd the whole herd the market herd everything was down about one percent but particularly when you looked into the fall and winter time frame the October and December contracts the market seemed to be saying down one percent is not down enough that there's a, this expectation of oversupply uh, going into there I suppose because China is not buying as, as much as they were rebuilding their own herd and so the market is trying to keep up with that expectation but just not fast enough uh, I'm going to tease to our Market Plus and one of the questions that we received is about the demand globally for the meats. So we'll keep going on that one. We're going to end in the, in the last 10 seconds here. I, I, I want to quick, quickly talk about oil. That's still hovering above 100. Is that going to stay in this area? Sure. I mean, the oil is one thing. It's the refined products that are the killer for agricultural producers and for consumers just driving on their summer vacations. I mean, the, this is the trouble. Is this the, is the, the refinery trouble. capacity. The refinery capacity. We'll put a pin and keep going. Thank you, Elaine. Thanks, Paul. It was a long question. It's all on me. That's going to do it for this installment of Market to Market. We'll talk more in Market Plus. So join us there. Find that on our website of markettomarket.org. And all of these resources, as a reminder, are free. Now, here's this week's assignment. We want to hear from you. Send us a photo of you in your field. It may not be knee or head high by the 4th of July. Email that to us at market to market at iowapbs.org. Next week, we check back in with two producers on their crops progress. Thank you so very much for watching. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.